It's Gareth Wimbox, it's Gareth Wimbox, episode six. Welcome to Gareth Wimbox, episode six. Episode six, slightly later than I anticipated, but nevertheless, here. Um, hello, welcome, welcome back, <coughs> everyone. Thank you for listening, as ever, and I hope you've been enjoying uh, the Windbox. Got uh, some special issues coming up in the next few weeks. Um, more of that uh, later. But today, Gareth Windbox. This 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 episode of Gareth Windbox, uh, which is. Um, which I'm recording on the 6th of March, 2023. And for some reason, the UK has decided to enter into another Arctic slipstream. So I'm sitting here with a lovely scarf um, that my friend made me, my friend Alice made me. And it's around my neck. It's giving me a neck hug, as well as a body hug, actually, because I've got it tucked into my um, cardigan. Cardigan, actually, incidentally, that I found in my parents' attic at home uh, that was my father's during the 1960s, I think. And it's got like a patch on the corduroy patch on the shoulder. It's a zip-up affair. It's a sort of waffle, waffle, um, waffle wool, uh, deep blue. It's lovely. Anyway, so this this episode of um, Gareth Winbox is called Disingenuous Poetics. Disingenuous Poetics for reasons that will become clear. And our, I'm going to talk a little bit about disingenuousness um, and some synonyms in relation to that. And then I'm also going to um, talk about the context of a poem that I wrote um, and then read the poem and then talk about the poem. And then I'm going to end. Uh, we're going to have a little segment towards the end where um, I show you what happens when when I have to listen to the music um, of um, companies when I call them up. Anyway, so disingenuous poetics. Disingenuous, such a great word. And it's something that's always haunted me throughout my life, disingenuousness. The idea that you are... Uh, perhaps inauthentic or doing things tactically. So I have my Oxford English Dictionary here, my shorter Oxford English Dictionary. Um, and disingenuous, disingenuous. Um, 17th century error for disingenuous. Disingen- disingenuity, disingenuousness, disingenuousness, the opposite of ingenious, uh, ingenuous, sorry, the opposite of ingenuous, lacking in frankness insincere, morally fraudulent, morally fraudulent, the opposite of ingenuous. Um, that's interesting. So, so frankness, uh, opposite, um, lacking in frankness, insincere, morally fraudulent, disingenuousness, the quality, 1674, the quality of being disingenuous. And the next word after that is disinhabit. To, to dis people. So I suppose one could say that to be disingenuous is to disinhabit the state of authenticity in some ways. Um, with the prefix dis um, going against, like the opposite of, etc. Disingenuousness, quality of uh, lacking in frankness. So being frank, insincere, morally fraudulent. So of course, ingenuousness is associated with um, frankness with sincerity, and being morally um, upright, uh, morally good, uh, whereas disingenuous is the opposite of that. Now, disingenuous is an interesting word, and just to talk about uh, ingenuousness, I've also looked up the word ingenuous. Um, Because, of course, we always use the word ingenious, um, but ingenuous is rarely used, and Disingenuous is an example of one of those words that's only ever used in the negative with a negative prefix. Information we use more than formation, uh, which is interesting, I suppose. Um, ingenuous. Ingenuous, 1588. Native, inborn, noble, frank. So disingenuous would be to be non-native, 
uh, to be somehow external, export, exborn, uh, unfree, uh, non-noble, and lacking in frankness. So ingenuous, one. Of free or honourable birth, so I suppose um, born into the right circumstance and the right family, you know, with a, with a family. Also of animals or things, befitting a freeborn or highborn person, liberal, honourably straightforward, open, candid, frank, guileless, innocent, artless. Guileless, innocent, artless. So ingenuousness, guileless, innocent, artless. So that's that's what I find um, fascinating with the word, is the disingenuousness is somehow tied up with the notion of uh, perhaps performance or trying or artistry. And so there's something um, fake or artificial about uh, disingenuousness. Um, and disingenuousness also pl- implies uh, a certain sense of agency. So deliberately being unfrank, deliberately being mor- morally um, um, non-upright or morally was the term. Uh, morally fraudulent so deliberately being fraudulent with one's morality but also artless I like that ingenuousness means uh, uh, ingenuousness means being artless then in poetry and in um, literature but poetry specifically Veronica Forrest Thompson in particular spoke of artifice or poetic artifice now she wasn't of course the only one think about that but she what she was talking about is sort of the all of the mechanisms and the poetry in the russian foremost sense uh, makes language strange and how you can control these sort of artifice this artifice um to create a uh, very specific um and um poetically uh um poetically uh, particular uh effects by controlling the artifice so rhyme uh, patterns um, other kind of uh, Im- Im- imagery patterns, uh, d- uh, long conceits and things like that, and re- repetitions within the framework of a poem. It's called artifice. These are these sort of um, artifices of the poem. But if you think about it more generally, um, ingenuousness it Im- implies that there is some state behind the artifice which is an authentic now which is the authentic state and the if and the if you are disingenuous you are uh, agentially or, de- or deliberately willfully moving away from from that um so disingenuousness itself and ingenuousness the binary of these two things um encode an inner and outer the inner being the authentic the truthful uh the uh the unencumbered uh, the, the sort of nakedly innocent uh, and the external being the artifice or the performance now as I was thinking about this word I was thinking about autism and thinking that um, uh, that people might experience or you might experience one uh, one person one might experience oneself as uh, inauthentic and in a sense that's where masking comes in because masking is the attempt to um, fit in with um, the norms and cultural norms and conversational norms and uh, affective and behavioural norms. Um, and so, you, so autistic people generally would mask in order to create that. And so the masks essentially are could be considered <clears throat> uh, disingenuous, apart from if you subscribe, as um, some nutters do, to the idea that autistic people don't have a theory of mind, or that that is to say they don't have the self-reflection to know themselves. So therefore, disingenuousness, which implies a degree of um, agency, could not be applied to an autistic person because they're they're not deliberately masking, that is to say, they are doing it from an authentic position of just having to mask. So that's so, in other words, the artifice is an is an authentic expression of coping. Um, anyway, but uh, I think that sense of disingenuousness for myself has always pervaded 
me in the sense that I always felt like I was faking, uh, and in, in many ways I was. But to dovetail with that, it's perhaps why I'm always, I've always been interested in artifice and poetic patterns and literary style and patterns and tones that are created through rhetorical structures and artificial structures. Uh, or language that is language that is um, subject to uh, willed um, extension into patterns that are indulging in and of, in and of themselves. In, in other words, artful patterns. Um, but again, so tied up with that, <clears throat> uh, the inner, the outer, the use of language, the extension of language to extreme patterns. Uh, to create what might be considered sort of the artifice of the poem. That goes back, that, that makes us think of the authenticity of the writer. Now, of course, um, this, this notion of the authentic heroic artist expressing their true feelings to the world is a romantic invention, um, but it still persists, it's a pernicious romantic invention that still persists to, the, to this day. People like Veronica Forrest Thompson knew that, and and following on from the lead of T.S. Eliot, uh, knew, knew that that, that uh, in in poetry, poetry was the performance of personae, um, and uh, that art in 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 Eliot's sense should be impersonal, whether that's possible or not. In other words, exploring objectively states of being, without having to relate them back to an author or any kind of notion, putative notion of authenticity. Um, so again, what, 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 where we are here is in thinking about the um, sense of uh, whether uh, emotion or state of being or literal states of things that are explored in poetry, whether they are authentic or whether they're performances. Of course, anyone thinking about it would realise that as soon as you start using language and as soon as you start telling an anecdote, uh, it, it becomes um, less authentic as, or, or, or confected and changed around. You change narrative patterns around um, to suit the, the dynamic of, of what it is you're saying. So therefore, the authentic thing that happened uh, is never going to be fully portrayed in language. And then when you enter that into a, the performance of uh, uh, um, prose or poetry, then it becomes more and more artificial. But is it disingenuous? So all, all uh, writing, I suppose, could be considered to be, even if even the most effusively, nakedly uh, true poem um, relies on artificial structures. Now, why am I saying this? Well, this dovetails with a poem that I wrote a while ago. Excuse me. Well, this so the poem I wrote a while ago, and it was for Radio BBC Radio Five Live Four. Now, for whatever reason, I've been listening to BBC Radio Five Live for a long time, and I think I think the arch seriousness. Of a lot of um, uh, of Radio Four and Radio Three, three for that matter, sort of a point um, kind of uh, gets on my nerves in some sense. Uh, and um, the so I, I sort of I quite like the sort of joviality and and uh, in in formality of a lot of Radio Five Live. Um, and you get I get you get attached to certain presenters uh, throughout the day. Um, so, um, Nihal Arthanaik is, is fantastic into really good interviewer. Uh, Adrian Charles is actually quite, quite cool on the radio. Um, and Claire and Tony, uh, during the drive show, Claire McDonnell and Tony Livesey during the drive show. So I listened to them quite a lot. Uh, I'm trying to, I'm trying to listen to them less actually because the sort of aggressive banterage on the, on the show, um, is quite clawing. Nevertheless, they, they've been a sort of soundtrack to my life for quite a while. And as people may know, uh, on BBC Radio 5 Live, they have a very strong component of writing in, uh, um, listeners writing in and uh, with opinions and stuff. And I have been read out a number of times on BBC Radio 5 Live, but also they have played my 
um, voice notes that you can send in to close shows as well. Um, and Na um, Naga Manchetti um, has played a few of my voice notes. Um, I did one about what, what I was proud of over the weekend. I made a wood, a wood hold, <clears throat> a wood bin. Um, and I also sang her a song, which I'm not going to go into, but, um, and to do with Hugh, um, uh, to do with an actor that she had on. So, you know, there's this little free genre of, um, limpic, uh, dopamine rush when you write a red out on the radio, but also it fulfills my, uh, desire to be on the radio and to be listened to, to people, um, to use my voice. But there was one item... There were two items on BBC Radio 5 Live a while ago. Remember, we're thinking about disingenuous poetics. And over the course, it was over the course of the week. So, I'll just, just very, very briefly tell you the, the tale. They're, they're one of the sh all, all the shows often have a theme that they get people to send in. Uh, they sort of, they, they sort of, they, uh, the, the, the Tony and Claire will say, <clears throat> you know, I did this, uh, we found this story about that. Now, audience, tell us the times when you, for example, had a really bad date or uh, one of the most recent was um, embarrassing world books, book uh, day costume stories and things like that. So, so there's a theme of the show. And the theme of this show was some guy had, had um, uh, created a youtube uh, created an extension to his house just by watching youtube videos and i can i can understand that because i i do a lot i learn a lot of my woodworking techniques from um and other things you know how to do stuff in the house um through watching youtube so that was the thing and that, so the, the the theme of the show was tell us something that you've learned just from the internet or from watching youtube so a woman got in touch um and um said that she had learned how to milk a horse um, through YouTube, which, of course, um, they had to follow up because that's a very, very ear-catching thing to say. So they did, and the idea was this this woman had a horse um, that was in was just about to foal, and apparently if you milk the horse and test the pH balance you can, of the milk, you can, you can tell to, to when they're going to, when they're going to foal. So this, this woman uh, phoned in and they had ch chat with her and of course it was a fascinating subject. And on the show, so uh, the, the, from, the sh from the show being about tell us what you've done, tell us what you've learned through YouTube, it segued into let's name the horse. And so people were going, getting in with their horses' names. And apparently in, the ho in horsey world, in equine, in the equine world, um, thoroughbred horses, you have to name them throughout the alphabet, rather like naming... Stormfront. Anyway, so this horse was called what was the horse called? Uh, Vasanti, and the 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 foal had to be called with the name V. Uh, so first thing I did was text in and say it's got to be Veronica after Veronica Forrest Thompson. But then, sort of almost very very fortuitously, there was a story on the radio about a little girl in um, that had been covered on Newsroom about a little girl, girl called Viola um, and it was on Newsround and apparently she had lived in a house near Kiev uh, with her mum, her sister and her dog Ella um, and in one morning Russian tanks sort of came around and you know it's a terrible 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 um, time for her uh, there were huge explosions and so she, her and her mum and her sister had to run away you know, with the sounds of bullets sort of whooshing around them. It's, it's, it's a horrendous story. Um, and then she... So they covered... Newsround covered this, and apparently she she had to leave her little dog Ella behind. But apparently they've gone back to their village now, which is, which is of course, devastating. And she, she just wants to go back to life as it was. So it's a really, really moving, moving story. And so, so after that story was told during the same program, everyone, like mo most people sort of, were writing in saying that it's got to be Viola, like that's that's got to be the name of the horse. And I think um, they called the woman called again in a week or so, and the horse is now called Viola. So it's a lovely story. So this we've gone from this kind of whimsical, strange, light-hearted story, segueing with a very very tragic story of a sort of little girl and her family, and then we named, named the horse Viola. Now there are loads of I'm. As I said, I'm quite conflicted about it. Let me, let me, so I wrote this poem. 
I sort of tried to write this poem. So after the story, I sort of thought, right, I'm going to send in a poem to the show about this whole, these two stories. And I, so I wrote into the show, but I wrote, um, they didn't cover it. Um, they didn't, they didn't uh, air it. And I wrote to Claire um, to, I, I put it in the WhatsApp, but then overnight I wrote this to Claire. Uh, I said this, dear Claire, I wanted to write to thank you for the show yesterday. I was one among hundreds to respond to your request and name the foal. I first chose Veronica, but then voiced in again to suggest Viola, Viola, after that amazing feature about the brave little girl in Ukraine. Uh, and I continue, I often feel conflicted about the light-hearted segues in the programmes of Radio 5, and particularly my own lavish contributions to the whimsy. But I also really believe in the Five Live ethos, providing rolling news, but also telling stories of listeners, whether tragic, comic or heartwarming. So this is me sort of, sort of saying uh, um, I'm conflicted, but I like your show, which immediately probably is a red flag to anyone uh, to be kind of critically engaged with um, or with the ambiguity and ambivalent about the ambiguity of of the show, you know, whimsy and tragedy. Anyway, so I say, I continue, I just want to say thanks to you all. Also, uh, blah, 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 no. I say I've written a written a, vi- a vi- viola poem if you want to hear it and I, I um, send it to her. Um, and I also sent a typed up version of the poem to her. And as I say, I didn't receive, I didn't receive this response, which is not surprising. Uh, I mean, that's fair enough. I, I don't expect, I don't demand people to respond to me. Now, I was a bit disappointed, but at the same time, I this is I, I, I see why they might not have done, because it's a bit of a heavy poem. Um, and probably would take too long to air on air. But anyway, I'm going to read that poem. So remember the story that I've just told you. So what I did is I did what I normally do, which is to do tons of research. So I researched around um, the name Viola, um, literary characters in Viola, um, and um, found some really interesting things. In fact, one of the things that I didn't manage to to um, uh, to incorporate <clears throat> um, into the poem was uh, um, Viola Fischerova, um, the the Czech poet um, who was born in uh, 1935 and died in 2010. Um, and so I, I'd never heard of Viola uh, Fischerova, but and so and Arc, Arc Publishing have, have published a collection of her poems, and I haven't read her yet, but I, I would like to read her poetry. So I and so I was trying to find a quotation from one of her poems to incorporate into my poem, but I didn't. But anyway, so Viola Fischerova, um, I'm gonna check out and read her work. Anyway, but I, I managed to incorporate other violas, like the most famous, or perhaps most obvious, cliched one would be Viola in Twelfth Night. Um, so anyway, and um, this is what I wrote. So this is my the poem that I wrote. <clears throat> it's called Viola d'Amour. Viola d'Amour. And Viola d'Amour is a um, Baroque instrument. And I, I say that in the poem. So, Viola d'Amour. A foal was born to Radio 5 Live, whose Catherine, Catherine was the name of um, the, the woman who owned the horse, or who looked after the horse. So, a foal was born to Radio 5 Live, whose Catherine sleuthed to ensure that she thrived by YouTubing how to milk a horse, an ear-catching story to cover, of course. The PH portended a short gestation, feisty Vasanti controlled parturition, and foaled when it suited an equine daughter, accompanied re-YouTube with probiotics, towels and water. In the background we waited for the work for work word of the birth, while the world continued through tragedy, through mirth, and out of these motions came Viola's tale of her frightening encounters with war's bleak travails. We learned of her plight, for which we all grieve, when she ran as the bombs hit her village near Kiev, she held her mum's hand, gripped her sister and left, leaving little dog Ella with a neighbour bereft. They're back home now, at least, but they still live in fear. Viola longs to play piano, to laugh, live, endure. These two stories mingled with fortuity on Drive's daily show with Claire and Tony, the foal stretching legs in new vibrant life, and Viola so young, expressing, expressing Ukrainian strife. What else to call the fledgling horse but the musical name Viola, of course? Viola, the viola de Moor is a Baroque instrument whose sympathetic strings enhance sentiment. The stories of Foal and the brave Jinchena 
uh, girl in Ukrainian, apparently. So the stories of the fallen and brave Jinchena remind us that we all must fight all together. Let these stories prove with Twelfth Night's Viola that tempests can be kind and that soft waves can be fresh in love. So that's the poem. Now, as I was reading that poem, I was wincing. And one of the reasons I was wincing is because of the disingenuousness of it. Disingenuous not because I didn't I wasn't moved moved to humour and warmth by the horse story and to empathy and um uh grief, you know, that that the, 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 what the little girl is going through in, in Ukraine. But wincing at the terrible rhymes and also the fact that I was writing for a Radio 5 register, which is obviously a much, much more popular medium than I would ever write for. Not, not that I'm being... It's just I, I generally don't write in that sort of way. But the whole poem is seems to be exploitative of a range of emotional states, and whether that be humour or grief and then confecting a kind of whimsical poem, which also then segues briefly into sort of a serious tone about, about Viola uh, and the, this tragedy of war. And so it, it, it fuses what I say, what I talk about in that email, the whimsy and the tragedy, and then creates this disingenuous piece. Now, I would say this, for me anyway, this is entirely disingenuous poetics. It's not that... It's not morally bankrupt, <laughs> or, or but it's totally artificial. It's artificially confecting uh, stuff out of the stuff of life um, in a way that's designed to entertain. Also designed to sort of impress um, the use of Jin Chenna. Um, um, and then, the, but the terrible rhyme remind us that we all must fight all this all together, which I would never, ever write. Um, remind us that we must fight all together because, of course, we're not all fighting together. It's it's it, 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 it's trading on that notion of like we're all in it together, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the use of Shakespeare sort of try to be impressive. The the uh, uh, idea of looking at the viola de more, which is a baroque instrument. Now, I'm not saying that I didn't get a sort of certain degree of joy out of writing this poem, but then should I? Should I be exploiting these subject areas uh, to to write a, a poem just to just to have it read on air? Um, it, 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 as I say, I, 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 I'm reading this poem and sort of thinking about it and saying I, that part of me is, is sort of proud that I can produce a text like this. But at the other side, the other side of it is, is feeling wincy that it's deeply disingenuous, that I'm inhabiting these artificial states. In, in a sense, I'm sort of um, commodifying actuality uh, to to provide the profit of my own titillation, as it were, or the profit of, of getting it read on, 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 on the radio. Now, I think that's a brutally honest uh, appraisal of this poem. Some people might write a poem like this or read, hear a poem like this and think, wow, that's, you know, that, that, well, that's, that's an interesting poem about this sort of, st sort of state, state of affairs. But I think most, most people perhaps that I trust would sort of say, well, what, what, what is the point of this? Um... And there is no answer to that. The, uh, so what I'm saying is that I think this is an expression of uh, poetic disingenuity, um, disingenuousness. It's a in slightly ingenious poem, and I'm not saying that that's a good thing necessarily. It's, it's ingeniously wrought, that is to say. Um, but is it ingenuous? Well, no, it's not. It's, it's entirely disingenuous. There are moments... It's not that, that, that the author, it just happens to me, is, is being fake or inauthentic. But there are motives behind the writing of it that are, that cannot, that are not simply pure, as it were, um, to be appreciated, to, to be read out on radio, to get my name out there, to, to show people that I can write and produce rhymes and you know create stuff out of uh things that it's it's entirely disingenuous but then isn't 
isn't doesn't writing come with those other motives and the idea that anything could be entirely any writing anyway could be entirely ingenuous uh, is is a myth but I think it's incumbent on writers and particularly perhaps poets uh, who <clears throat> exploit uh, the actuality of, of, of people's experiences to think hard about these things to critique their own uh, inclinations perhaps towards such exploitations uh, Andrew Brady one of my favourite poets and whom I interviewed on a, on a podcast called Talking Poetics which is on, available on YouTube she's great about this she's, she's very very articulate about these, these the states that I'm outlining is disingenuousness um, and stuff but I think the disingenuous poetics is probably a, a really interesting theme to think about uh, which segues and dovetails with the notions of artifice. So there we go, that's Viola d'Amour, and that's me thinking about disingenuousness and poetics. I'm going to save, I'm going to save the riffing stuff that I talked about uh, before for another episode, because I quite like the fact that this one is only 31 minutes long, or 30 minutes long. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that. Please, as I, and I'm also going to save my announcement of what's coming up uh, in a while uh, to the next episode. So, it's Garros Wimbos, it's Garros Wimbos. Well, I'm totally out of tune. Garros Wimbos, it's Garros Wimbos. Anyway, thank you for joining. Join me next time on Garros Wimbos. Goodbye. Goodbye.